Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, if some of you are watching. Uh, you know, um, we in in some difficult times, and we hear that a lot. Everywhere we go, we hear we're in difficult times. You know, the chaos and the turmoil and the wickedness, all of these things. And you know, uh, several months ago, I woke up one morning and it was on my mind, you know, why pray? Why should we pray? And so today I would kind of like to share some thoughts that I feel that the Lord has shown me. I'll try not to take too long, but there is so much. It's just so, so much about prayer that uh, it could take a long, long time. Uh, first, let me just open up real quick with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share your word, Lord, and some of your thoughts. I thank you, Father, for the ladies that watch these videos each week. Father, I pray that you would speak to their hearts through them. And Father, that they would be able to apply your word in, in these things to their lives during this time. So Father, I just um, give myself to you right now, Lord, and ask that you would use me, Father, to share. And Father, that you would share what you want, not what I want. So Father, I thank you, and I, I bless you in Jesus' name. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say, you know, prayer. You know, God is not a sugar daddy. We just don't run into him whenever we feel like it. I mean, we can go to him when we feel like it because he is our Abba Father. And we can go any time, any place. And we can go with confidence because he wants. But we can't just go with the gimme, gimme, gimme attitude we have to remember that he is holy and sovereign, yet he's merciful as well as compassionate. And when we come to him, we have to come with fear, which is respect for him, not, you know, trembling fear, unless we're doing something we're not supposed to, but um, in reverence and humility. Um, and with that said, I'd like to talk a little bit about prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is communion and interaction with God. It's not just uh, us talking and asking, but it's spending time listening to what he has to say as well. Uh, prayer is one of the highest forms of worship. It's a two-way conversation. At least it's supposed to be. And that's why I say gimme, 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 because a lot of times we just go in we say, give me this, give me that, do this, do that. And then we don't take time and listen and wait for, for answers or wait for him to speak to us. But we just get up and go about our day. Why do we pray? First of all, Jesus commanded us to pray. He prayed. And then we pray because we love the Father and we want to know him more and have a relationship with him. Now, a relationship of love is enjoying one of another. Uh, an example would be like, if I love my husband, I want to spend time with him. I want to share things with him. I want to hear what he has to say. Um, and I want to get to know him. And that's the same way it is with the Father. If we love him, we want to spend time with him. We want to listen to what he has to say. We want to share with him all things, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, my friend and I, we have coffee together, and, and uh, we do. We share everything, good, bad, and ugly. And this is a, a, a friend relationship, a friend love. And this is what we need to be doing with our Father. We pray out of gratitude. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes down to us from God the Father. And Psalm 118.29 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. We have so much to be thankful for. And we should not take God's goodness for granted. You know, we 
should be thankful because we have a home. We have a roof over our head. We have clothes to wear. And unfortunately, mine don't wear out, so I don't get to, to buy new ones. But um, we have food to eat. We have family and friends that love us, even if we can't get together all the time. So we have so much to be thankful for, for his, his provision and his love and his mercy and his grace. Remember the ten lepers that Jesus healed? Only one came back to give him thanks. Let's not be that one, or let's be that one that comes back and gives him thanks. Don't be like the other nine that just takes what he has to give us and then just go off and take him for granted. We pray because we want to know God more fully. How do we get to know someone? I think I already said, by spending time with them, talking with them, and listening to them. And that's what we do in prayer. We need to have the mind of Christ to look at life from our Savior's point of view, having his values and desires in mind, to think God's thoughts and not think as the world. And as we speak to God, to know him more, Psalms 27.4 says, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and dwell in his house forever. Another reason we pray is we pray to acknowledge our dependence on him. When we don't pray, we're depending on our own ability. We're depending uh, and having confidence that we can do this. And we're telling God, you know, I can do this. I don't need your help. Peter was prideful and told Jesus that he would follow Jesus even to death. He even lopped off the ear of a centurion when they came to arrest Jesus. Yet later, he denied that he even knew Jesus. Had he prayed in the garden like Jesus told him to, Peter probably would not have denied Jesus. We are not independent human beings. We need to depend completely on God. Paul preached, in him we live and move and have our being. Acts 17, 28. We're nothing apart from him. Read the scriptures and learn of Jesus' life and totally depend on God and his Holy Spirit. And this is a good one. We pray against temptation. We are not able to resist temptation in our own power. And Pastor Charlie has several teachings on our website, teacherofthebible.org. And um, he uh, shares on different um, facets of prayer also, which would be good for you to read. But I'd like to share just a few paragraphs out of what he says about um, temptation. Lead us not into temptation, Matthew 6, 13. One of the most important prayers in the Bible is found in Matthew 6, 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This same prayer is found in Luke 11, 4. The place where we completely diffuse temptation's power is in the prayer closet. It is in prayer where your spiritual eyes are open to Satan's subtle traps. It is in prayer that you receive discernment and spiritual insight into his deceptive schemes. If you are not earnestly praying, you will give in to many seductions and temptations. Without prayer, you are vulnerable. I think it is important to see that you are praying against temptation before it ever comes. You are praying in advance. In other words, prayer closes the door to many temptations so that they never come, and it breaks the power of temptation's attraction when it does come. Thus, your victory over temptation comes from the Lord through prayer. Again, without prayer, you are vulnerable. And I thought that was really, really good because it's so true. That's when we overcome that's where we get victory, is when we are in prayer, in our prayer closet. Jesus was the strongest man that ever lived. He had all, all authority. He was humble. Yet we read in the Gospels that Jesus prayed a lot. 
He would spend night in prayer. He would rise up early while disciples were still asleep. And as his crucifixion approached, he agonized in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed about everything. So if Jesus prayed about everything, then you and I need to pray about everything. Prayer is not a sign of weakness. It is us depending on God. Jesus prayed because he completely trusted and depended on Father God. Now, you know, that takes some growing. When we're first saved, a lot of times it, it's really, um, um, we de- just so in love that we just trust him, you know, like little children. But then as we grow and all these things <clears throat> come in, we start to um, depend more upon ourselves. And we don't think that we need him in even the small things. You know, I'm kind of s- silly maybe, but <clears throat> I don't have anybody to help me with when I get dressed to go to church or to do just simple things. <clears throat> and then, so uh, sometimes I'll say, Father, you know, what do you think? What should I wear? How do you think this would look? And, you know, it's, it's not that I'm being disrespectful or anything. It's just that I want to be presentable as a um, person that represents him, you know. And <clears throat> so on certain occasions, I'll ask him, you know, well, what should I wear or should I do this? You know, and it's not bringing him down to my level, but it's, I respect um, his thoughts. I respect what he tells me, you know. And usually it comes together. <coughs> excuse me. We pray because, <coughs> excuse me, God uses means. The thought came, why pray if God already, in Matthew 6, 8, says, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So why pray for someone's conversion? Why pray that God will heal my body? Why pray for anything? Because God chooses to use means. He uses rain to make the grass grow. He uses the sun to light the world. He uses our prayers to accomplish his purposes. And when we pray, humbly acknowledging our dependence on him. <clears throat> he wants his children to ask him. You know, when we ask him things and pray about things, and he answers those things, then it builds our faith. And it builds our relationship with him. It builds a trust with him. And he said that, you know, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask amiss that you might spend it on your, yourself. You know, in other words, you're asking with wrong motives. So there is a purpose. Yes, he knows everything. Yes, he knows what we have need of before. But he wants us to ask. You know, our earthly fathers, you know, I'm sure they know that we need all these different things, but sometimes I think they want us to ask, you know. Um, And then that way we can see their love for us. They can see how they care for us. We can see how they provide for us. Another reason he commands us to pray. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18, he says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Prayer is hard work. It's not easy. It takes discipline and demands our best. Prayer builds our faith and it builds a relationship with our Father. You know, we don't want to just give him a few moments at the close of the day when we're tired and our mind is all full of all the stuff that happened during the day. We're weary. Our strength is at its lowest. And also, we don't want to just jump out of bed in the morning and run and 
drop on our knees and, like I say, just talk and talk and talk and tell him all the requests and tell him everything and then just jump up and go. We want to take that time to listen. We must make time. <coughs> Excuse me. We must make time for quality communion with our Lord. <coughs> I'm sorry, my throat is all messy. Prayer along with the sword, which is the word of God <coughs> and the spirit, are our greatest and most powerful weapons <coughs> in the warfare we face each day. We will not be able to be victorious without them. If prayer is indeed our ultimate weapon with which to defeat and crush Satan, we have to develop prayer habits. Learning how to use weapons of prayer takes practice. <clears throat> we learn by, you know, we learn by listening to others. We learn by practicing or being in situations where we get on our knees and humble ourselves before God. We can also learn by reading the Psalms. There's a lot of prayer in there. We learn to pray by praying. You know, when you're first saved, <clears throat> you don't really know how to pray. <clears throat> I mean, you, you just might say a few words, but as you listen, you hear others pray, you read the word, you read the Psalms, you uh, listen to the Holy Spirit, then you learn to pray. It's like, how can we use the sword, the word, or prayer, unless we pick them up in practice? Lenore shared on knowing how to use a sword. If you don't hold it properly, it would be of no effect, and you could probably hurt yourself or someone else. And it's the same with <coughs> prayer. Let me give you an example. Okay, uh, when a baby is born, <coughs> they don't know how to do anything. They don't know how to walk. They don't know how to eat. But they learn by practice. They first stand up around furniture. Then they take a few steps. Then they fall down. Then they take some more steps. Or when they're eating, it's like they have their little fork or spoon with the food on it and it misses their mouth, or the food falls off. But with practice, <clears throat> he learns how to eat. Some of us learn really well. <laughs> and he learns how to walk. He learns how to do things. And such it is with prayer. <clears throat> And then you might say about the, the baby, well, somebody's teaching him, somebody's holding him up, somebody's, you know, showing him how to do this. Yes, and we have the Holy Spirit Amen. who teaching, is teaching us. Amen. The more we pray with the Holy Spirit's guidance, the more we learn to pray. I read this book, <clears throat> No Easy Road by Dick Eastman, which is an excellent, excellent book on prayer. And you know, if, if you'd like to read, I would suggest that you read it. It is really awesome. I took some things out of this book. And Dick Eastman said, prayer is developed through experience. Anyone can pray. God is not seeking those that are intelligent or have a high social standing but he's looking for those whose dedicated hearts with prayerful burdens. And God longs for those who work at prayer. His word declares the earnest, which is sincere and intense conviction, prayer of a righteous, which is a person with right standing with God, has power and wonderful results. James 5.16 in the Living Bible. Now, when's the best time to pray? This is up to the individual. It, it depends on what works for you. And it's not what time we pray, but it's rather our heart and our motives in developing a habit. We can pray any place 
anywhere. Jesus said in Med, ought to always ought to pray and not lose heart. Luke 18, 1. So we can pray. We should actually be in an attitude of prayer all the time. And that's where pray without ceasing comes in because you ha you're in an attitude of prayer. So whenever something comes up or you see someone needs prayer, it's just like you can automatically, you know, pray for that person right there. Even just a whisper a prayer, think a prayer. Um, you know, you don't have to run and get on your knees at, in the grocery store. You know, you can just step aside and, and say a prayer for the need. Jesus gives us examples of what we should do. We follow him in baptism. He shows us how we should pray and serve others. And in John 13, 14, 16, Jesus tells us that the slave is not greater than his master. So if Jesus prayed, we need to pray. We're not greater than him. During the stay-at-home time, <laughs> the enemy had me believing a half-truth, which affected me for quite some time. I thought, you know, I have the whole day alone. I don't really have any big commitments. I can stay up as late as I want. I can sleep as late as I want. And nobody really cares. Well, I noticed that when I got up, say, nine, maybe mid-morning, depending on how long I stayed up the night before. Even though I was alone, in my mind, I could sense the busyness outside, and it was distracting. Or I was get up late in, I'd say, oh, I gotta do this, or oh, I have to call this person, or maybe somebody call and say, I need you to do this. And so therefore, I didn't have time to pray. So needless to say, my goal is, <laughs> I've been doing a little better, is to go to bed earlier. And I have been getting up earlier. And it does make a difference when you're there in the morning in the quiet. You probably wonder, how can she hear traffic? She can't hear. <laughs> well, like I said, in my mind and my spirit, I'm hearing the traffic. <laughs> Jesus, um, yeah. The psalmist said in Psalm 63, 1, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. Jesus prayed early in the morning in Mark 1, 35. Early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. It was important to Jesus to get away where he wouldn't be disturbed when he was talking to his father. He could have uninterrupted fellowship with his father. Psalms 5.3, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. Psalm 59, 16 says, But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning, for you have been my defense and refuge in a day of my trouble. Praying in the, when we pray in the morning, we're telling the Lord, you know, you're my number one priority. You come before everything. And praying in the morning prepares us for spiritual attacks and can help you defeat the devil and strengthens you for whatever you encounter for the day. A few moments with Jesus will set the course of your day. And, and that is so true. You know, when we pray first thing in the morning, or first thing when we get up, you know, some people may work evenings, when you get up and you pray first, it sets the course of the day. It, it protects you, and like Pastor said, lead us not into temptation. If you pray against temptation, you're already preparing 
that if that temptation does come, you're preparing and you're going to have victory over that. So, um, like I say, you can pray anytime, anywhere, and whatever works for you, but at least make it a habit to pray daily. It's uh, morning or first thing when you get up. It's a good time to pray. We need to understand and realize who we are praying to. It's not some stranger. We call him Abba, Daddy, and we can come to him any time, any place. I think I said that, but we come with fear, respect, and, and reverence. He is the great I am. I love the I am. Sovereign Lord, creator of everything, almighty God, our Father, who is holy, yet loves us more than we can imagine. And he's there waiting to hear from us. You know, it just bring me a thought. You know, my children are uh, live uh, out of town. And you know, I long to hear from them. And they'll text me, but if a couple of days go by and they don't text me, it's like, I long to hear from them. Even if it's just, hi, I love you, how are you doing? And you know, Father's no different. He longs to hear from his children. He longs to have that fellowship. He longs to have that relationship. He longs and wants to give you good things. We pray in his will. And in order to pray in his will, we have to know what his will is. And we find that as we pray and search the scriptures. His scriptures tell us what the Father's will is. Too often prayers fail because we just do have that gimme attitude. It's all about me and my wants. What can God do for me? And it's not about him. We often voice prayers but don't wait in his presence. As we spend quality time in his presence, and when I say quality, I mean heartfelt prayer or time, you know, just really wanting to be with him. We learn what his will is and understand why some prayers go unanswered the way we expect. Take Paul, for example. In 2 Corinthians 12, 8, he asked God three times to remove that thorn in his flesh. And in verse 7, Paul accepted God's will that his grace was sufficient for him. You know, sometimes when we pray, it, it's, Father doesn't answer exactly what we want or how we want it, but he answers what is best for us. You know, Paul had um, God taken away that thorn. Paul was proud and boastful, and this thorn was there to keep him humble. And a lot of times, you know, things in my life, when they're not answered the way that I want them answered, it's, I know it's for a purpose. I might get upset at first, but I realize it's for a purpose, and it's for my good and his glory. We need to know what the scriptures mean so that we can know his will. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, though being sinless and being God incarnate, prayed, not will but thine. Luke twenty two forty two. He was in agony and struggling and just, he knew what was coming. And he really, he would rather not have gone to the cross. He would rather not have been, you know, crucified. But he prayed and he said, Father, not my will, but yours. He wanted God's will far above his own. Is that what we want? Do we want God's will above our own? I can, I'm going to be honest and say a lot of times I really want my, my way. But I am really learning that my way is not his way. And his thoughts are not my thoughts. And um, I used to be a pretty independent person. 
And uh, unfortunately, that's independent, means independent of others or of God. You know, you're depending on yourself for everything. But I've learned that oh, that's not the way to be. <laughs> Jesus gave the disciples a way to pray. In Matthew 6.10 it says, Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in 1 John it says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. A lot of times we take scriptures out of context and we say, Well, he's, the word says that if we believe really believe we can have anything that we ask for. Yes, we can, if it's in his will. I mean, I could pray for a, a new house or a big car or something, but if that's not in his will, I can believe all I want and I'm not going to get it. So I'm being facetious there. <clears throat> You know, being an uh, independent person, sometimes I struggle with doing things my way. And needless to say, I usually end up in trouble. Then I have to humble myself and go to the Father to help, have him help me get it right. And he does. He gave me a scripture. Oh, I just shared that. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. But he did give me that scripture that my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. Everything that happens to a born-again child of God has a purpose. When we go through difficult times and we ask God to get us out, maybe things don't change, we need to stay close to him and ask for strength and peace as we go through them. These trials can prepare us for someone else who is going through the same thing. You can give them hope by sharing how God brought you through. There's a person in my life that um, she's very much like I was at that age. And uh, she is, goes through some difficult times and she'll text me and ask me questions. And because I've already been there, I've already been through that, and some of the things I still go through, I am able to share with her and encourage her in the faith. Um, the same way that I've been encouraged in the faith by others. We have to pray in faith. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrew 11.1. 1. The dictionary's definition is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And Hebrews 11.6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he comes to God who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, it will give you all kinds of um, um, examples, different men of faith um, that can be an encouragement and an example for you. Faith is not feelings or emotion. They can lead us to delusion, delusions. When we pray according to God's word, we can pray in faith because we trust him, because he loves us and wants to do good things for us. Lenore's going to be giving an, uh, can I share that? Lenore's going to be sharing on emotions after this. And trust me, I am an emotional person in Philly, and they can destroy a person. You don't go by feelings, but you go by faith. And faith, a lot of the times, is total opposite of what you feel. You may feel something, but you go to God's word and see what he says about it, and it's, that's what you, that's what you uh, lean on. That's what you trust is God's word, no matter how you feel. Remember Job's wife? Remember Job's wife told uh, him to curse God and die. And we know that Job had been through a lot. All in one day, he lost his children, 
his property. He was afflicted with boils. But Job continued to trust God and told his wife, Shall we accept good from God? Shall we not accept adversity? In Job 10. Do we only want good things from God? I don't like trials. I don't like things that are painful. But those things, those trials and those, those painful things, when we lean on, on uh, God, they teach us trust. They build our character. I'm already a character, but they build <laughs> different kind of character. <laughs> and so we need to accept both of those things. But in the trials, like I said earlier, we pray for strength to get through those things. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo? They trusted God in spite of the situation. They refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar and were going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar was going to make the, the fire quite a few times hotter. I don't remember how many. And that's in Daniel 3.17. But they trusted God to save them. And even if they didn't, they still wouldn't bow down. So that's kind of an example of um, they're trusting him, but even if it didn't go their way, they were still going gonna to trust him. So when we pray in faith and trust God for the answer, it will be for our good in his glory. We must pray in faith as those who had unshackled faith in God, such as Enoch, he walked off with God. How neat is that? Abraham, Moses, and Joshua. Abraham believed God and was willing to sacrifice his son because he knew that God would raise him up. Moses saw the promised land, although he never entered it. Joshua believed God, and he and his troop marched against the fortified city until the walls came down and he took the city. Now, if someone tells you to take a, a, a jar and put a light in it and walk around the city seven, seven days, you know, it's like, really? But Joshua trusted God, that God knew what he was doing. Noah believed God, and he and his family escaped the flood. Now, we must pray fervently and persistently. When we seek God in earnest and sincere prayer, he reveals truth and nuggets to us by his spirit who guides us in all truth and shows us things yet to come. John 16:13. If we're, we are to spoil Satan's diabolical efforts, we must begin with fervent, persistent prayer. C.S. Lewis from the Screw Tape Letters said, Satan wants to interfere at any price and fashion when people start to pray. A real prayer is lethal, deadly to his cause, and he will do anything and everything he can to keep Christians from praying. You will have distractions and trials and all kinds of things to hinder prayer, which I'll share a little bit later. Daniel was on his knees 21 days praying for his people fervently, persevering in prayer, perhaps discouraged but never giving up. God sent the answer to Daniel the first day he prayed, but on the way, the heavenly angel, who I'm assuming is Gabriel, because he's the messenger, was deterred in battle with the prince of king of Persia, who was trying to keep the answer from getting through. Michael, the archangel, was sent to help, and the battle lasted 20 days until the answer was finally given to Daniel on the 21st day. Now, had Daniel given up and quit praying even a few days earlier, the answer may have not given through. Dick Eastman says Satan can hold back the answer for a time, but he cannot stop the final answer if we persevere and pray. And Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that we should always pray and not give up. We all know the story of the friend at midnight. A man went to his neighbor and knocking and asked for three loaves of bread. And the man said, the neighbor said, no, I'm in bed and the doors are locked. I'm not getting up. However, the man kept knocking and knocking and asking, and finally, Jesus said, though he will not rise and give it to him because he is a friend, 
because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Luke 11, 5, 8. You know, how often have we prayed for days and months, maybe even years, and not seen the answer? Or maybe we get weary and want to give up? If you're praying for someone's salvation, keep praying. If you're praying for healing, keep praying. If you're praying for better finances, keep praying. Whatever it is you're desiring, continue to pray fervently and persistently and don't give up. Luke 22, 44 says of our Lord, he prayed more fervently and he was in such agony that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. And James said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We don't always see the results, but if we pray earnestly, fervently, and persistently in holiness and Father's will, we can know that it will be done. We're to be intercessors. Intercession is placing a prayer's emphasis on others rather than pleading for ourselves. It is a genuine caring about others. It is the act of intervening on behalf of others. The Cambridge Dictionary says, to intentionally become involved in a difficult situation to improve it or prevent it from getting worse. I like this definition because in intercessors get involved. Friends, family, neighbors, or government officials, country need intercessors who will diligently stand in the gap and pray. Amen. Amen. People are fearful and hurting. We have family and friends who are going through difficult trials and getting anxious, depressed, weary. They need people who care and who will travail and be persistent in prayer for them. People are fighting spiritual battles and losing ground. They need intercessors. The Bible tells us that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, 1 John 2, 1, 9. An advocate is a helper, a friend who picks us up when we're down, and that's what we should be to others. An advocate intervening on behalf of others. It was after Job prayed for his friends that the Lord made him prosperous and gave him twice as much as he had before, Job 42.10. Had Job not prayed for his friends and interceded for them? We don't know. And there's a very good example in Deuteronomy 9, which you can read later because it's pretty long, but it's basically when Moses came down from the mountain with the commandments and Aaron had made a golden calf and the Lord was very angry with the people and he was going to destroy them. And Aaron, he was really upset with Aaron. But Moses got on his face and fervently prayed and prayed and prayed. He interceded for the people in Aaron that the Lord would not destroy them. And he didn't destroy them right then, but later. <laughs> Ezekiel 22, 23 through 31 sounds a lot like our world today. All the wickedness that's going on and the Lord said in verse 30, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Our family, our friends, our country our governors, our president, they need someone to stand in the gap. One of my favorite stories is when Moses, and I tell my friend, you know, we'll be Aaron and her. <laughs> but one of my stories is when Moses, Aaron and her went up on a hill and while the Israelites did battle with the Amalekites, as long as Moses kept his hands up, the Israelites would keep winning. But when he got tired and his arms started falling down, the Amalekites started winning. So Aaron and Hur got on each side and they held Moses' arms up until um, Israel had victory over the Amalekites. And that's what we do when we intercede for our brothers and our sisters. 
when they're engaged in warfare, when they're sick, when they're tired, when they're weary and exhausted, sometimes not knowing if they're going to make it, they're wanting to quit. We lift their arms up in prayer, in intercessory prayer, in fervent prayer, diligent prayer. You can find that story of Moses in Exodus 17. Now, very quickly, what are some things that can hinder prayer and answers to prayer? Unbelief and doubt. I mentioned earlier that we need to pray in faith, and the opposite of faith is doubt or unbelief. In unbelief, we're not trusting in God's promises. We're not trusting that he wants to give us good things. How often when I pray did I tell the Lord what to do or how to answer prayer and then I'd expect him to do it that way. Then when he doesn't answer the way I expect, I get disappointed and then I think, where is God? He's not answering. We don't really believe that he'll answer. No, that's not true. <laughs> he answers. It's just he answers his way which is actually better for us. You know, if I got some of the things I asked for, oh my goodness. When we doubt things of the things of God, excuse me, when we doubt, think, when we do doubt, think of things that God has been faithful in and never failed it before. He is still the same. A lot of times when I think a little bit of doubt, I think, oh my goodness, the Lord has been so good to me. He really, really has. I am blank, blank years old, but <laughs> he has been so faithful and so good to me all these years. And another uh, let me give you a quick example. I wanted some new furniture for my living room a long time ago. I prayed about it, and I knew pretty much what I wanted. And my buddy and I even went shopping and looking for things. We found one that I kind of liked, but it just never came about. Well, I waited and then kind of forgot about it. And a couple of weeks ago, my nephew and his wife gave me some very nice furniture. They got new furniture and they gave me theirs. And believe it or not, it's pretty much the color, the style, a little bit different style. The style actually is... is there's just a couple little things that I didn't pick on the other one, but it, it's Father knows what I like and what I needed. So instead of rushing out and buying something I wouldn't be happy with, I waited and Father gave me a blessing. He knew beforehand I was going to get this, so I didn't get the furniture before. James 1, 6 through 8 says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not the man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The Israelites, because they didn't, the Israelites didn't enter in their rest because of unbelief. Hebrews 3.12 says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. You know, with all the circumstances and everything, we, we, our, our, our faith can be, really be tested. But we have to stand. Remember when the disciples were on the boat and the storm arose and they saw Jesus walking on water? Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and in Matthew 14, 31, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when Jesus told the disciples uh, when they weren't catching fish, he told them to put their net on the other side. And when they did, they had faith, they trusted him, they put the net on the other side. And they caught their nets full. Now, had they not been in faith, Peter would have probably drowned. They would have went home empty-handed with the fish. 
sin will definitely hinder prayer. We can't live like the world and expect God to come into God's presence in prayer and then expect him to listen. He is holy and sin cannot stand in his presence. Holy living set apart for God is essential in preparation for prayer. Psalmist said, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, my Lord would not have listened. Psalm 66, 18. Psalm 55, 18 says, if I regard or hold on to iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If there's some sin in our heart that we don't, that we like and we don't want to let go, just remember, we can't, we can't hide anything. We can't hide anything from God. He knows what's in our hearts. And if we think that we can do our little sin over here and then we can go uh, before the Lord and ask him for whatever and think he's going to answer, according to these scriptures, it says he will not hear you. Don't throw those tomatoes at me. <laughs> Do we sin? Yes, we sin. I sin many times a day in thought, word, and deed. That's why before we begin to pray, we need to confess any known sin and repent of it and ask for forgiveness. And this is not to be done lightly, but with a humble, sincere, and repentant heart. Because God knows if we mean business. If we do this, God promises in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I hold on to that scripture because I am wretched. My thoughts are not pure all the time. And I need his forgiveness. Unforgiveness is a biggie. I think we've all struggled with unforgiveness at some time. Unforgiveness affects our health. It can block our healing. It affects our relationships. It affects our personality. We can be tortured. Read the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, 21 through 35. The last verse of that parable says, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from your heart does not forgive his brother's trespasses. Get that? From the heart. From the heart. And forgiveness sometimes is not easy because we are a self-preserving person and we think that, well, we have a right. We don't have a right. Jesus died to forgive us. So how much more? Should we forgive others? If we have any anger, hatred, or unforgiveness towards someone, it nullifies hours spent on our knees. If we have anger and bitterness, and we could pray for hours and hours and hours of no effect. And just hit home. <laughs> I am such a mess that I keep Father busy 24-7. Mark 11, 25 NIV says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Dick Eastman says that we must learn the greatest hindrance to prayer is sin, and Satan's goal is to keep us from our knees. Another win is excuses. I'm almost done. I only have 10 more pages. No, just kidding. We say we were too busy. Excuse me just a minute. Just. No, I'm not going to read that. That's a little story in that book about uh, the demons trying to stop um, Christians from praying, and they said, well, let's do this or let's do that. <coughs> I'm gonna do it real fast. <coughs> he said, um, tell the people there's no heaven or hell. And there's no afterlife. Satan said, it'll never work. Another demon said, 
Let's say God is dead. And though he started the universe, he has now left it. Satan replied in dismay, Man is too sensible for that. Some may swallow this, but these are fools. Most believe the psalmist's words are fools, say in their heart there is no God. No, they'll never do that. Other ideas were presented, but none brought home hope. Fear of failure gripped those ch charting plans to stop the revival. Finally, when ultimate gloom faced him, Satan leaped up in glee, exclaiming, I have it, a sure solution. Demons listened to his master plan. Go back and tell them God is real, and the Bible is God's word. And a gasp came from the group as Satan continued his strange command. Tell them Jesus Christ is God's son, freeing men from sin. Surely Satan had gone mad. With a smirk, Satan added, Then, brothers, tell them the best time to choose Christ is later. Help them make excuses. And that's what he does. Excuses. You know, well, I can pray. You know, I can pray, but I'll pray later. Um, oh, somebody's having this hard time. Well, God bless you. I'll pray later. Or, you know, how often has someone said, please pray for me? And you say, oh, I will. I'll pray for you. And then you go and, and you never do because you always have an excuse or you forget or whatever. And so their prayer goes unprayed for. We say we're too busy. Yet the busier the Lord was, the more he prayed. We don't feel good. We're tired. We have to clean house, shop for groceries, visit a friend, get ready for school functions, go to a Bible study, go to church, and the list goes on. My big one was, Lord, I'm tired. Lord, I don't feel good, which was true. You know, to do all these things is good, but we can't neglect prayer. The Lord showed me just a few days ago, he showed me that, yeah, you're tired and you don't feel good. You're in pain, but yet you can sit and vegetate in front of the computer or the TV. If you can do that, you can pray. And that's true. We can. No matter how busy we are, we can find time to pray if we want to. If there's something we want bad enough, we'll make time for it. And believe me, in these days, prayer is so needed. Several examples of excuse making the Bible are the disciples in Garden Gethsemane. Jesus told the disciples, stay awake and, and, and pray. And they slept. Had they stayed awake and prayed, Peter probably wouldn't have denied the Lord three times. God asked Adam why he ate the fruit. His excuse was, Eve gave it to me. <laughs> Moses made excuses why he didn't go to Pharaoh and lead the people. Well, I can't talk. Aaron, when confronted by Moses about people worshiping the golden calf, you know what his excuse was? Well, I put gold in the fire and a calf jumped out. When Paul had a discussion with Governor Felix about faith in Christ Jesus, righteousness, and judgment to come, Felix said, go away for now, and when I have a more convenient time, I'll call you again. His excuse was to wait for a more convenient time. He doubtfully ever found that convenient time. If we wait for a convenient time, it will never come. We must determine to spend time in prayer. There are many more hindrances to prayer. I don't have time to share. I've already shared too much. But closing out, I want to say that when people cease to pray, no matter what the reason, Christians backslide, youth rebel, cities decay, preachers leave the pulpits, and mission fields close. Our world is in complete chaos. Wickedness and sin are running rampant. Our country is divided. The government is telling us what to do. Rioters.
and Antifa are killing and looting innocent people. A lot of innocent people are getting hurt by all of this. They're losing their jobs. They're, they're being hurt physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. They're getting depressed. They're suicidal. All of these things. Jesus warned us that these things would happen so we wouldn't be taken by surprise. In Matthew, I think, 25, 24 and 25. Yet in all these things, we have the most powerful weapon, prayer. Doesn't matter what stage in life you are, young, old, doesn't matter what color we are, whether we're rich or poor, whether we have a master degree or not even a diploma, whether we're incarcerated or free, all who are born again and trusting in the complete dependence of the Son of God can come boldly in before the throne of grace and pray. When it looks like things are getting worse, we remember that God is sovereign and we worship him and pray in all things. Philippians 4, 6, NIV says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. If we are going to make it to the end and stand firm through everything that is coming, we must pray and fill our lamps with oil. We must not, we may not all be evangelists, preachers, teachers, or leaders, but we can all do the greatest thing and pray. Lastly, I would like to leave you with one of my favorite scriptures. You can read it in the Bible, Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. Sorry, I don't have that ready. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. In this part, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So as we're going through all of these things, we need not worry. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. So keep the faith, trust the Lord, keep oil in your lamp, and pray, pray, pray. Thank you.